Donovan, good to see you, man. Yeah. How you doing, Dan? Nice to see I'm you. I'm doing too. good, man. Thank you for doing this. Appreciate you oh. taking the time. Thank you. I appreciate it. How you uh, how you holding up at the moment in these strange times that we're living in? I'm okay. I mean, I feel like I was, um, you know, I went. It was just making a new record, so I feel lucky. I had good timing, lucky timing. Yeah. If I was like one of those people who had just started out on a tour or something, like those people had it much more rough than I did. So I feel, I feel lucky for sure. Well, you're you're like raising a toddler and co-parenting two of the kids, aren't you? So it's must oh, be yeah. nice yeah. to have this time off. Because I guess you've never had this amount of time off before. That was the longest I've been in one city for like I would say a decade or so. Yeah, and so wow. it's interesting. It's interesting that everybody. I mean, everybody's sick of me, and I would say my <laughs> partner is sick of me, and the kids are even sick of me, I would say, by this point. We'll see. It feels like it's going on, so we'll see what happens. So how has this kind of whole virus affected your plans for the album? Because I know you started making it back in February, didn't you? So were you hoping to yeah. release it earlier than this? Or? We were, yeah. We originally were going to release the record in September. I think we had, we're, I think we pushed it back two months now, so I think it's going to be in November. But um really it didn't i mean for a while we were operating on a plan that wasn't going to come out until next year and then i sort of when i started thinking about the real practicality of that it made me want to puke my guts out and die like i just didn't want to have to sit on these songs for that long i mean most probably you, most musicians say that like you know once the record is done you've kind of moved on from it so to, the, the thought of waiting a year and then releasing all these songs was like unbearable to me yeah. Well, I was reading another article that you did where you said you've had to kind of farm out jobs to all of your musicians. They've had to send in stuff remotely. Has that kind of changed the creative process for you? Is it kind of, have you lost kind of a, the creative spark a little bit with that? I mean, the only thing we lost was like the stuff that I love, which is the sort of camaraderie in the studio and, you know, challenging each other and joking around and trying to get something better and, you know, having that like live one-to-one real-time conversation about a part to try to get it to to try to get a guitar solo i mean there's no guitar solos but like it's not van halen or anything but like to try to get it to like to try to get a part to uh, you know an exciting place those types of conversations i miss those but really I mean, we have one day in the studio and then it got we got all we got the stay home order in canada so and we just everybody's pretty well set up to work remotely these days i mean we all i mean it just kind of started to happen uh but the things i missed was those real-time conversations about music you know we had to do that over voicemail and text and just zoom and stuff so but it was okay it was still okay i gotta tell you i'm absolutely loving the new song clean slate it's one of my oh. favorite songs of the year so far Thanks, um, thank you. Uh, Thanks. you you co-wrote that one with jeremy spillman and tucker bethard um yeah. and i mean i love tucker's music that he puts out himself i think mean, the guy's just an insane songwriter so what was what were those guys like to work with for the, the writing tucker, i'm a big fan of tucker's writing and he's and um he's you know when i first got paired with him um you know sometimes when it's he was a, at the time he was like this big machine guy on the big machine label in nashville and had just released this his big single it was called rock on um and it was like a big radio song so my you know i i went in to the right thinking you know th that he was going to be one of these nashville guys it became really clear early on that he was like a real writer who was you know digging in in a real a real severe way and and we got along immediately and, and quickly you know and I, every time i've written with him i think mean, we've written four times and every song we wrote has been cut by somebody like he's done two of them and i've done two of them i think so i'm just a yeah i'm just a fan of the guy and jeremy's another great writer he's a guy i really vibe with in a really good way so tell us a little bit about how the the idea for clean slate came about and how those guys kind of helped bring that one to life well, I, I had this sort of idea of a song with that title, and I had this the way that it, um, the way that that hook sits on top of that sort of you know, that guitar intro, the way that intro starts in, with the guitar, where it's that big sort of slidey progression. I had just I want to love you with clean slate, and then that progression. That's all I had, and I knew I wanted to write a song about you know falling in love as an adult and experiencing that sort of, um, that sort of sky, open sky feeling of the first few weeks of being in love with somebody as an adult, where you sort of know 
although you're swept up in it, you also know that it's weird and fake. And it's, you know, like you also know the flip side of the coin and you know that when it ends, it sometimes is not pretty. So um, I was just trying to get at that feeling, you know, from, from a different sort of more experienced point of view. Yeah. And you, you worked in the studio with Todd Clark on this one. And I love the work that Todd's done with the likes of Philip Phillips and Gavin Brewer and all these kind of people. So yeah. what, was, what was he like to work with? Todd is like um, an incredible sort of like, um, um, it, it, I'm so in love with the way he does vocals, the way the, the sound that he gets out of vocals is something that's thrilling. And, you know, it's a lot of work. You sit there for a really long time singing it over and over and over again. And um, when it comes out, I mean, I'm a, I'm a guy who like, I grew up in the folk music tradition, but really, I, I mean, I love pop music. I, I've always loved it. So to have my vocals, you know, stick out and stand out in a way that that type of stuff does, you know, the way Philip does or the way, you know, those Gavin Dubrow, those bigger acts do. I think that that over top of a folk setting is really compelling to me. So I'm, I'm always thrilled to work with Todd. Yeah. And just coming back to the songwriting a little bit as well, you mentioned how it's great to work with Tucker and you feel very comfortable working with him and Jeremy. Um, how do you generally approach co-writing? Are you one of these people who is happy to work with anyone or do you have like a set group of people that you feel very comfortable with and want to write with? Um, I have like a little bit of both. I have, I do have my, sorry, somebody is just like texting me over and over and over again. It's just driving me nuts. I apologize. Um, I have like my set, my group of people that I love and I try to cycle with and I want to be with as much as possible to write. Um, and then I, I just try to like stay open to the possibility. People surprise you all the time. Like even when you listen to the samples of the music that gets sent over by their publisher or whomever, you, you maybe don't connect with it. And then or if I like anything about it, I'll try it. If I like the voice, if I like the way the writing is, I'll just try it once and see if it works. Cause you really, you really never know, you know? And once sometimes you get in a room with someone that you didn't expect and you guys just work very well together and compliment each other. The only thing I'm so wary of is when there's someone who I think is very like me. I'm often like put off by that because I think like, well, I'm already going to be there. Why do we need this guy else? There? But even that is proven wrong to me. There's a guy who I wrote a couple of songs with on this record named Dustin Christensen, who's, you know, we almost look the same. Like we're basically the same guy. And, but for, you know, we do very well together. We write really well together. So I don't have any rules because they're all wrong and dumb, it turns out, usually. And in terms of the sound of the new song as well, you've got some kind of synth elements in there and there's a bit of an indie rock feel to it. So is that what we can expect from the rest of the project, do you think? What's it going to sound yeah, like? Yeah, this is probably the most bombastic, well, th this or the number two most biggest, sort of biggest sounding song on the record. Um, but they're like this in in sort of vocal tone, but the rest of them are kind of a little bit more hushed. This is sort of a, a, a bigger sound than the rest of the record, for sure. Yeah. And it's going to be following up uh, both ways from a couple of years ago. And I have to tell you that I, I love that album. And next year was like my favorite song of the whole year. I just absolutely oh, fell in love with next year. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, but that was such a strong body of work. So how do you kind of move on from that now? What's What do you hope to achieve with a new record? And what do you want people to take away from it? I was so, was so happy about that record. It was the first one that I ever got to make where I felt like I didn't compromise anything to a budget or anything like, you know, I was able to just make the exact record I want. And the interesting part about listening back to it now from the, in the years, you know, the two years of hindsight that I have on it is that it really was like a product of wanting to fill up the spaces that we were playing in. We were playing in bigger concert halls and we were playing sort of, we we're getting better slots at festivals and the songs that we had in the set list weren't really big enough to fill up those spaces. And I felt like there had to be some songs on both ways that could, could be big enough to fill up a room like that. And um, now when I listen back to it, I can hear that so, that's so observable to me that I tried to, this record, I tried to really rid that notion and, and get rid of that idea in my head and just write the exact things that I wanted to write. And who cares if they're a little too small or a little too sort of finely detailed, you know? Um, so that, that's, that's sort of what I was trying to do with this one. 
Yeah. And it's very cool to see that what you're doing with the promo budgets for this record, because you're putting it towards black owned and indigenous owned businesses, which is really cool. So how important was that for you to do something like that and try and make a difference somewhere? Because ultimately you've got to make a living as well. So. You know, yeah. Really I mean, we have, there, there's a lot of, I mean, there, in the promotion of a record, first of all, to say that, that I think like releasing art at this time of, you know, in 2020, I think it, we have to at least acknowledge the extraordinary context that we're releasing art and we're in the middle of probably the biggest human rights movement of our lifetimes and we're in the middle of a pandemic. I think like pretending that that stuff is not going on is one, like super strange. And then two, just asking people for their attention at a time like this is fraught with, you know, with, uh, you know, potholes. So I think like making sure that the release of the record includes the context of the extraordinary circumstances that we're in seems like a no brainer to me. It seems obvious, but also like, just say there's a lot of waste in, in the promotion of a record. There really is just like, you know, sometimes, you know, when you look through the budget, there's like, you know, street postering and stuff, which is makes you feel really cool when you're like walking down the street and there's a poster you on the wall. But you have to say like, how much value does this really add to my life or to the life of the record. So I think like taking that money and diverting it to an artist who's out of work or to somebody who uh, is running a, a small business who could use the money, I think right now is just the most important thing to do. Yeah, and that's very cool. if we can like all get something out of it, then let, that sounds like a better idea to me. That's awesome. And I wanted to delve a little bit into your songwriting that you've done for other artists as well, if you don't mind, because sure. I, I love some of the songs you've written, like the beginning of things for Charlie. Oh, thank you. I love that song, too. What a song. That is just an absolute classic to me. Oh, uh, like, Leave Nashville for Charles Kelly. And... The idea that Charlie is not famous is, like, I mean, like, it's not man, more famous than he is. It's like, man, the guy is the most underrated man I've ever seen in my life. And he so, must be so tired of hearing that, so it's annoying for me to even say it again. But, like, oh, my God, the talent of that guy. Everybody in Nashville just loves him. Like, it's yeah. just, like... Anyway, sorry, but I'm how, how is he? How is he not big at this point when everybody in Nashville across the board knows how good he is? It's strange. I mean, like he plays the Opry, and he like I mean he will find the spot. Um, I think he'll age into something that is more fitting of his talent level. But uh, you know, the thing like he doesn't make music that's it fits in the radio lane, and that's a kiss of death these days, which is a drag. But yeah. I do think that as he ages, he'll find a spot that like. Um, is befitting of his of his yeah. ability for sure. I'm sure he will. But like I mentioned, you wrote beginning of things and uh, leaving Nashville for Charles Kelly, Sweet Love, Bill Clinton. I love mm -hmm. all these songs. So are Thanks. these these kind of songs difficult ones to give away? Because there must be a part of you that thinks they might be good for me. Um. Yeah, I mean the interesting. I mean you can always do it. You can always just do it yourself too. I think like some people are so put off by the idea of releasing a song that's already been released by another artist. It doesn't really bother me, and that certainly doesn't bother you know like country artists. Like the, I wrote a song for Tim McGraw, and when he was going to cut it, we said, "Now I, I'm going to release it too." Like he couldn't care less that like a folk artist from Canada <laughs> is going to release a version. Like it's not going to affect his bottom line uh, one iota. So. You know, I, I, if I really love it, I will put it out too. But I also do, I do try to be really um, practical about them and say, I try to not be precious and say, just give it away. Beginning of Things was one that I, I mean, I love Charlie. So I, I was so obsessed with his first record, Rubber Band, that when he, when, when I realized I was going to be on the next record, I was so excited about it. But, it, you know, I try to just say, give it away, give it away. And Hopefully that mental space leads me to being more and more creative, you know. Well, you mentioned the song that Tim McGraw recorded and with the Billy Crinton song as well. What's mm -hmm. that like when you get the call that it's going to be recorded by an artist of that caliber? Is that like, that must be a huge honor. You know, what's funny is you don't, you know, like, the, you know, just as being in the music industry, you know how, uh, just how scattershot everything is. So even when you hear it, I mean, they told me that Tim, Tim McGraw was going to do it. And I was just like, okay, whatever, we'll see. It's just, I just know how fast things change in the music industry. Sometimes they scrap a whole album. I mean, it's just, ha it happens. So I was not, I didn't even believe it until the day I heard it. Or I like picked up the record in the store and saw it on the back. It was really the first time that I believed it. 
because you, you just know that anything can happen. And the Billy one, Billy Currington was just, we had heard nothing. And then all of a sudden, just one day he called my friend who I wrote the song with and said, I'm doing it. Will you send me the lyrics? And there was no, you know, nobody told us. We just, he just decided to do it in the studio one day. So it's like, you don't really have any time to, to let it sink in really. Yeah. Well, going back to your own stuff a little bit as well. Um, you recently did a track with Logan Myers, uh, Grew Apart, mm. um, which was really, really cool. So how did that collaboration come about and how long have you been kind of friends with Logan? Well, Logan recorded the first time, you know, I got, I got to know Logan because he recorded a song I wrote called Better Off Gone that I wrote with uh, my friend Abe Stoklasa. And Logan recorded that and really made it into like a pretty big hit on the streaming services. I think it's like up in 60 million range. Um, and he, I remember you just, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of Logan as an artist. And then I would see him post these videos of like 2,000 people singing this song at a concert, you know, and I just thought, what? This, you know, like, how is this happening? Um, so I got to know him that way. And he's uh, such a lovely, great guy. And after we wrote this group part song, I, I just thought he would like it. I just really sensed that he would like it. Yeah, so cool. I uh, sent it to him and said, do you like it? And he was like, yeah. So we, we worked out a way to do it. Yeah, I think I still find my voice to be a little bit ridiculous on that country song. But like when I enter in the yeah, second verse, awesome. I'm just kind of like, I'm, I kind of feel like, oh God, couldn't they have got a... Uh, not at more. all, dude, seriously. <laughs> it just sounds so whispery when I enter. But, yeah. <laughs> People seem to be liking it, so that's good. Yeah, it sounded awesome. Uh, and I was going to ask you about um, the Canadian scene in general as well, because it's an exciting time at the moment with uh, Lindsay L crushing it in Nashville at the moment. You've got some Neil Towns, who's becoming a huge name in country at the moment. That must give mm -hmm. you a lot of optimism and hope for, to see your own guys doing so well down there. Yeah, I mean, we, we I think like Canadian, we do we do really well in America in music. I mean, when you just look at the names, like Sean Mendez, The Weeknd, Justin, like these are all us, like, you know, like, um, and it doesn't like, you know, that, that sort of like, it doesn't surprise me when people in other genres have that success either because um, we're, uh, you know, a, a talented bunch and, and we're all, we're good at getting along, I think, you know, so like, you just end up with people like Tennille, who's like such a quality person and such a good songwriter. Yeah, one of the nicest people in the whole genre. Oh, so, like everybody fights for her because you just love her. You know, you love her when you meet her. So, I, I, you know, it does, it's, not, it's not surprising to me when people like that have have success because she's she's just a lovely individual. Yeah. And just yeah. before I let you go, Donovan, I wanted to speak to you about um, the possibility of doing some stuff in the UK because I know you've been doing some UK interviews over the last couple of weeks or so um yeah. we, and we would love to have you over here and i'm sure your music would go down so well so oh, yeah we did like fun. it was it's been two years since we've been but we and we were supposed to in the january and february of 2021 but it's got pushed obviously but i, I hope next year at some point or maybe the year after early depending on what what goes down but I, i'm a big I'm a really big London guy. I, love, I think it's my favorite city in the world. I love to be there. I feel very at home there for some reason. I, you know, I grew up like obsessed with Oasis. Sure. So I have this like mythology about Manchester and this mythology about London that like probably a lot of people my age have when they loved Oasis. And then when I was in university, I got really into Mike Skinner and the streets. So I have all of this sort of like, baggage about london that i love and so man, as soon as we can come back i'll be back for sure all right man well Donovan, thank you so much for chatting with us man we really appreciate your time and um thank you man. yeah we'll hopefully see you in the uk once all this rubbish is over and we can catch up in person that'll be cool well, as soon as that vaccine happens i'm i'll put it in my arm don't worry <laughs> <laughs> well, i'll be one of the first test guys so no worries <laughs> Right, right, man, we need to get you over here but thank you for doing this again we really appreciate it man and best of luck with the new album because thanks man i appreciate from what we heard so far it sounds awesome so oh good, good. I'm glad. Well, it'll be good i think it's good i think you'll like the whole thing <laughs> all right man look forward to hearing it thanks then take all care cheers, man. Bro. speak to you later